Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Bryce Rosenblum. I am, there we are. Bryce Rosenblum, founder of the Winter Jazz Fest. Um, and uh, pleasure to have you all here this afternoon. Uh, sorry, of course, we can't all be together. Um, hopefully next year for Winter Jazz Fest, whether we're uh, on screen virtually like this, we'll also be able to be there in person. Um, today represents uh, the final event of this extended season of Winter Jazz Fest. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have the speakers here and uh, the host, uh, Nayama Sophia Sandy, who's been a tremendous collaborator with me on Winter Jazz Fest programming and specifically with this series. Um, and one of the silver linings of this pandemic has been uh, some of the relationships we've been able to build. Uh, and one of those is specifically with uh, myself and Nyama. Um, really rich, uh, valuable relationship that uh, I'm grateful to have established. And uh, it benefits us all, us all right here in the programming that we've created together. Um, I also want to remind uh, you all uh, in our jazz community, another valuable silver lining that has created has been created during the pandemic. Um, we helped launch an organization called Jazz Coalition, supporting musicians with commission grants. And um, instead of asking you to purchase tickets for any programming that we're doing, we're encouraging you to donate to Jazz Coalition uh, at jazzcoalition.org. And specifically, that money goes to commission uh, musicians to create new work, remind them of their value and worth, and uh, keep musicians working and creating work representing the times we're in. Um, and on the topic of creating work, um, I'm thrilled to pass the mic to Nayama Safia Sandy, who can tell you all about this incredible program, Fertile Grounds. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much, Bryce. Hello, everybody. Happy Saturday. Thank you for joining us again for this final installment of Fertile Grounds. This series brings together visionary artists across disciplines to discuss their inspirations and pursuits through their creative practice. Fertile Grounds is a celebration and an acknowledgement of the expansive spirit of creativity that feeds, moves, and inspires us all. I'm so, so, so thrilled today. We have Matana Roberts and Jared Key joining us. I invite you both to turn your uh, microphones and cameras on. Matana Roberts is a self-taught mixed media composer born in Chicago. Though she earned two degrees in performance from a smattering of American institutions, her primary training was from free arts programming in the American public school system. Roberts has been called a major talent and the spokeswoman for a new politically conscious and refractory jazz scene. Her coin coin work has been widely and highly praised for its stylistic innovations and narrative power. Noted music critic Peter Margasek has written memory is powerful thing, but it's so private, fluid and unreliable that it can seem almost impossible to capture in a work of art and history is often no more stable once you look closely enough. Roberts has succeeded at evoking both though and gives her audience a long look at something ghostly, tragic and beautiful. She's carving out her own aesthetic space, startling in its own originality and gripping in its historic and social power. Of her work, Matana says, at my artistic core, I'm firmly dedicated to creating a unique and very personal body of sound work that speaks to and reminds people of all walks of life to reach, stand up, give voice and regardless of difference created from mere labels of intellectual classification. In my ideal world, the word difference is an illusion designed only for modern economic division and elitist intellectual hierarchy. Through my life's work, I creatively stand in defiance. I could go on, but I'm sure she will love to share more with you. Also introducing Jarrett Key, wonderful, wonderful person that you see on your screen right now. 
Jarrett Key lives and works in Providence, Rhode Island. He's a recent MFA graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design's painting program. Key is one of Forbes 30 under 30 for arts and culture, I'm sorry, art and style in the year 2020. Key's practice embodies several modes of production in one frame. Through form, image and material, the objects they make integrate a sculpture, painting and performance practice. Excavating lost stories and the oral histories that define their upbringing in rural Alabama, Key's work seeks to criticize those historical conditions that are seeds of contemporary issues in their life, while creating spaces that celebrate beauty, joy, and survival. Key has been featured in exhibitions at Fearman Gallery, 1969 Gallery, Steve Turner Gallery, the RISD Museum, La Mama Galleria, the Columbus Museum, among others. I'm so pleased and thrilled to have you both here. I'm so grateful that you both accepted the invitation. Um, and I'm just gonna leave you to it because that's what I like to do with it. <laughs> like my hand is present in who I've asked to be here and that's all that there needs to be. So uh, also for those of us joining, if you have questions for our panelists, please pop them into the Q&A at the bottom right of your screen. Um, and I'm just gonna, disappear unless you get to it. Thank you Great. so much. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. <laughs> um, this is great. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Um, we, you know, caught up a little bit. And the thing that became so clear to me is, you know, our paths as interdisciplinary artists involve so many mediums, involve so many kinds of educations, involve so many different languages. But the primary language is music. Um, and so can we start there? Can we start like with, you know, I, I feel like I read someplace that you um, started with classical clarinet. Yes, so I, um, a free public uh, school program, uh, a guy came to the school and, and showed off some instruments I would have done seven, maybe seven or eight. Uh, and he had all the, I remember, I'll never forget, he had all the instrument families divided up and you go from table to table and, and listen to him play the different ones. And the one I couldn't, I remember going home saying, I have to play that instrument was the clarinet. There was something about the sound, you know, we were talking about landscape earlier. There was something about the sound of wood, of mm. wood vibrating where I just said, oh, I need to do that. And I, I heard the saxophone that day too, but I, I had no interest, the clarinet. Um, and then it just went on from there. It's, it's, it's been a bit of a journey. And I tried to, I wanted to be an orchestral clarinetist at one point, and I was really headed towards uh, that sort of occupation. And then I just got really tired of the, the non-diversity of the documented repertoire. Like I just, mm -hmm. at a certain point I was looking for models and I wasn't seeing anyone that looked like me really. Unless you talk about like, uh, my grandmother said Beethoven was possibly black, you know, the old rumor. <laughs> yes. you know, but I couldn't find, and, and there has been, there's an incredible history of black musicians and classical music, but you don't get to learn about them the way that you'd learn about some of these, um, you know, these great white composers, but still white composers, yeah. mostly male. Like, wasn't Mozart's violinist, like chief primary transcriber and violinist, a black guy? I feel like that maybe this is also this like this retelling of history, music history, but um, I definitely heard that too. Cause and, I feel like, you know. Oh, there's a lot of, of that. Yeah, that's amazing. I feel like, um, that's funny, I, I guess I had a similar experience with music for me too. I went to this all black Catholic school in Alabama that everyone in my family, um, it opened in like the 30s, 1930s. Uh -huh. And um, it was primarily run by white nor Northern nuns during segregation. Um, wow. So as a really beautiful, um, strong place for black, kids to go that didn't cost a lot of money. It was like, it was basically a public school with like some, a little bit of fees. But right. um, so I, you know, we started with recorder, like we, like, I feel like so many kids do in the first and second grade. And then a similar situation, like this guy came to school 
I can't, I can't think of his name right now. He worked in a music shop in Columbus, Georgia, but he brought a flute, he brought a trumpet, he brought a saxophone, and he brought a clarinet. Mm -hmm. And I, for some reason, I could not, the flute was just the instrument to me that I just loved the most. I think I loved it at the time because it was the smallest and I could like basically, you know, pack it up, put it in my book bag and didn't have to like worry about, you know, my brother was playing saxophone, he chose saxophone and he was lugging that saxophone around everywhere. But you know, I, when I went to high school, I was still playing flute and, and at the time I had never really taken private lessons. Like I still like, you know, it was Mr. Handy, I think was his name, Mr. Handy, you know, he did that for a year. I got some books from the music store and sort of taught myself until I went to high school and did band in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was like, oh, people take private lessons. And I started like competing and like doing independent, like state competitions and stuff like that. And realized I was actually really good at flute and like had no frame around me to even tell me that, you know, I, I was even good, you know what I mean? Just like loved doing this thing. Um, and also was thinking I considered heavily moving into a classical flute place, but then I sort of, you know, I left high school was thinking, am I going to be an opera singer or I'm going to be a classical like food player? And yeah, I came to college and did neither one of those things. <laughs> and what was the shift? What, what was the final shift? Yeah, so I feel like I spent so much time, I love music and music is something that you can do by yourself. And it's a, a really beautiful and specific way to tell a story. You know, as a flute player, I did not, I just was not, I, I really wanted to do things by myself and I was really committed to solo playing. And as a flute player, like that wasn't necessarily the kind of the career path that I wanted to go down. Like I could have definitely done orchestral music and symphony music and, but I definitely was, you know, I wanted to do stuff that I wasn't having to be bothered by the canon, honestly, and be bothered by the competition that you get when you're trying to, you know, go to a city, get into the local orchestra. Like I was not interested in that. And similarly with opera, you know, opera singers, your whole life is your voice. You use, you use your body to make so many different crazy sounds. And for me to, for me to be that reliant on only my voice was really scary. And I think that I, cause I was like, even in college when I got sick and I couldn't do the recital, you know, that's very scary and I'm going to get sick. And so it became, I, I started moving away from centering myself as a performer and thinking about producing, thinking about directing, um, and thinking about and writing. And so, and that sort of moved me all the way into New York City where I was working in the public theater and producing. Um, and I did that for four, four or five years. And then, and, and now I'm sort of, I graduated this MFA painting program, but I'm returning back to music because I'm writing this opera that's very inspired by the paintings that I'm making and the oh, garments that I'm making. Um, and it's like a new way, yeah. And I'm, you know, of course I'm rejiggering what an opera looks like. Right now I'm sort of doing um, a one man show, almost like if I could tell you an opera with a, like with the cargo box, you know, and I could pull all this stuff out of this box and I would come to these different characters and there's like this small narration that helps us to tie the story together and the music together. But um, currently that's sort of the project. It's gonna be like a full opera with like 20 people. But right now I'm like doing this really weird experiment of trying, yeah, what does it mean for me to just, you know, what does it mean for me to sing a soprano role in, counter tenor voice and then move into um, a childlike voice for the youngest child and, and really just allow myself as a performer to just play all these different and be in all these different spaces vocally, um, which is very fun. Remember the work of Richard Kennedy? No, I, I, well, I, someone else literally said his name to me like two well, days ago, three days ago. Y'all need to talk if you will, and I can also make introductions if you need, because his process is really interesting. And I think for some of the things that you're talking about, you would find his process really fascinating too. How do you, how would you talk about, um, how would you describe your process? Like, you know, like, how do you start? You know what I mean? What, how do you start? <laughs> and I don't even know what that, like, because our work looks like so many different things, you know what I mean? But when you can see a, a project, yeah, how do you start? It depends. Like it, it's, I wear so many different hats and sometimes I say, uh, why didn't I just choose one hat? Why didn't I, like, why didn't I do that? But I think it, that also had a lot to do with survival. Like there's no, it never seemed like survival was possible on the one hat roadmap though, though we both have friends who, you know, they're, they do that. Um, but for me, 
everything that I do is about my own curiosity of, of what's possible, what's maybe not possible, how far can I push the limit? Is there a limit? Um, I don't believe in boundaries for myself personally, creatively, and that's got me in trouble sometimes too. You know, because you don't want to yeah. be, the, what do they say, jack of, jack of all trades, master of none. Like, I don't want to do that. But I'm really fascinated at what can, the synthesis that can happen when you combine, combine different creative acts and, and the magic that you can't even envision while you're making it until you see it or until you hear it. And then the feedback loop that that creates. Um, but it really did, I, you know, I'm like really obsessed with American history that's never gonna go away. And I, that partly has to do for, for about, that partly has to do with the type of family that I'm from that's just very politically and historically minded. Um, but I'm also really fascinated with the body and how the body works and partly also for what you're talking about, you know, how as an opera singer, you know, you can't get sick. What happens if you get sick? You know, um, I'm curious about things like that. And I'm very curious about the natural world and, and the commonality, commonalities that exist through all three of those things really fascinates me. But I don't do anything I don't want to do, which is, um, I'm so grateful for that. I always think that's going to stop at some point, but it hasn't yet. So <laughs> yes. you never know. Art life yeah. is not linear. It's got hills and valleys and ditches and, and so many black holes. Um, and you can plan as much as you want, but you just never know. I mean, last you year. Never know. Example, like you just never know what's going to come along and knock everything down. What's your process like these days? Yeah, well, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of reading and writing and drawing as a way to, and I really, I feel like I read, write and draw really to do, to make anything. If, even if I'm making a garment, if I'm making, you know, if I'm writing this opera, if I'm thinking about a score, if I'm making a painting, I feel like so many of the things that I can find clarity about happen on a sheet of paper. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, reading, writing, and drawing. I feel like, you know, it's kind of interesting for me because I was making, I'm making these cement paintings, which, you know, are cement and I mix it with acrylic and I kind of work on them while they're wet, like a fresco and add material and pigment to them. But the images themselves actually come from, you know, me, making these, this opera, the scenes from this opera. And me making this opera happen when I was sewing this big garment. And I was just like, you know, you're making a, I'm draping this eight foot tall gown and I, you know, it's silent in my studio and I just began to hum. And then ideas came to me and I was like, oh, I'm writing a song. And then I like kept going and I was like, no, this feels like, is this a song? Oh no, maybe this is like a, is this a musical? And I was like, no, this is an opera. And then I was like, oh, okay, so where's happening? How does this fit in with this opera? So I took the garment, I drew it on a piece of paper. Again, I drew it again. And then I put stuff around it. And I was like, oh my God, it's, everything is happening in a natural landscape. And at the time, the, the things I was reading and the other things that were drawing and writing were Black people hanging out in natural landscapes. And then I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And then, you know, so I'm also a sculptor. So I like put down my pen for that day and went to the, black, to the foundry and I was making these hot combs um, that I make out of black steel in a forge. So I hit them and I, and I hit them and I hit them and I hit them until they're flat and then I cut teeth in them. And they become these almost figurative um, sepulchers, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that work is very tied to my grandmother and me just trying to like come to terms with some things that happened in my family. And then I was like, wait a minute, I was holding the hot comb as it was red hot. And I was like, what if this is a way in the opera for the families to define their lineages? Like what if this hot comb becomes the object of bequeathment? You know, and so my process is very much like, okay, and I'm, I go back to my studio and I keep sewing. And then that, um, that kind of, that these new ideas spur other new ideas and really inform each other, you yeah, know? That's fascinating. I mean, when you say, the hot comb, though, I that gives me chills because I have I do have some hot comb memories and they're not pleasant. 
you know? (laughs) Do to to ourselves or feel we have to do to ourselves in order to um, fit in with the certain status quo that makes us feel bad about the fact that actually we don't need to do those things. Exactly. I can, when you say hot comb, I can even smell. Exactly. The smell of the burning hair or, you know, the accidental burn on the back of your neck because you you did it wrong. Or God forbid, you know, your mother, your grandmother did it for you. And, you know, <laughs> and they're yanking your head around. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking about <laughs> I'm getting chills. But it's just, it's fascinating to hear. So you're talking kind of about a feedback loop of sorts, an organicness, a naturalness that happens. That's fascinating. And it allows me in the similar ways that you were describing that, you know, I don't have limits on my practice. You know, if I, if, if I came to grad school, like I graduated grad school last year and I came to grad school being like, I really need to learn how to sew. You know, I wanna learn how to sew. It's important to me. It's important for me because I make performances. Yes, I am in a painting program. <laughs> I have to learn how to sew. And someone was like, why don't you get someone else to make your costumes? And I was like, you know, even if it takes me five years to understand how to construct a garment, no one can take away the fact that I understand how to make a garment. And I will be able to make a garment for myself at any time. You know, there are no limits. There are no boundaries. There's no time. There's no time restraints. Like I I am dedicated and curious about the material interests around me. And I want to keep exploring, like the blacksmithing. I've been blacksmithing for two years. I'm not the most amazing black. I can make what I can make very well. You know what I mean? There are a lot of other things that happen in blacksmithing that I'm like learning how to do as well. But it's important for me to learn how to do those things and take the time to do them. Even if like 10 years from now, that's the first time that I have a big show with hot combs. You know what I mean? I took this time to learn this practice and process. Yeah, and it's your curiosity and your creativity and your path. And I don't, I always tell people like your options are limitless. No matter what anybody says to you, or no matter even how you feel, you cannot, you, however you're exploring your creativity or whatever thoughts you're having, you have to think in kind of an abundance mind frame. Um, because I mean, I'm sure you've experienced it. I, I have experienced too, people telling me what I cannot do. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like okay cool I'll see you in a year and you're gonna be gagged yeah, or right. I mean the, or in the grad school thing it's like two weeks later you know here's the garment that, I, that you told me couldn't get made you know what I mean no but that's amazing that that's part of your explorative process I mean you know it just so much so even with the hot comes like so many of the things that I get curious about making I mean come from questions about my family you know, come from questions about my own personal narrative. My grandmother straightened her hair with a hot comb her entire life. She used to have a really, and like, she would not get a perm. You know what I mean? Like, she did not get a perm. I mean, in a sense, the perm was better than the perm. Exactly. And that's, I mean, that's how she felt for sure, honestly. Um, And and I was just like, what is this hot comb? And I literally, and so she passed away in 2004. And in 2014, I went to bed, I was living in Brooklyn. I went to sleep um, at 2.30 in the morning because I was kind of working full time and then coming home and oil painting in my apartment until I like basically passed out from the fumes. I didn't realize the oil paint was bad for you. (laughs) I had no idea, I had no idea. Now I know so much more about the material. Um, But I went to bed and at three o'clock she said, Jarrett, your hair is your strength, paint with it. My whole life, my grandmother said, your hair is your strength, don't cut your hair. And my mom was always getting her hair cut and doing it and trimming her hair and doing different stuff. And my grandmother was like, why are you cutting your hair? And obviously this is from the Bible judges. Um, And you know, yeah. And so all these various questions just made me think like, and my next question to her was like, how did my grandma hear that story? My grandmother did not read. So she must have heard that story from someone in church Or like someone told her her hair is her strength and not to cut it, you know, and that's why she never cut her hair and that's why she used a hot comb, you know, and so like this hot comb then becomes as much as it is about trauma it's also it makes me think about the first black millionaire woman millionaire, you know, it makes you think about the ways that so many black people have felt empowered in order to even. You know participate in society or have a voice at which is very much like my grandmother 
And so, yeah, so all these, and yeah, yeah, so that's how things come about. Even the garments were like, oh, I was curious about this color, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Um, you know, Madam C.J. Walker is buried in the Bronx. She's buried in the same cemetery as Duke Ellington, Miles Davis. I used to go see her. It's, it's something. She really had to fight to have her grave put where it was because generally in that um, cemetery, they put the Black folks on the edge. <laughs> like they want, you know, you can't be in, you know, the center. And, and she and her family really fought to make sure that she had a plot that was central. It's very nice. Wow. Yeah, I need to go. I um I need to go and visit. Um because there's just so much history that is around us. And maybe you feel this way too. And it feels like you're, you're, the way that you talked about your family, for example, and the way that history becomes important in your family. Like sometimes I just feel like it's important for me to just listen. You know, in a way like in in a, in a musical way, just like listen. Um and really try to uncover the things that are around me because they're right there. It's so important to um, it's so important to talk to your elders, whoever is still around. I don't have many who are still around. Both of my parents have walked on, and uh, I still have questions for them that I wish I would have asked. But also, you know, grandparents or or there's certain stories or certain ways of being. You know, there's certain things about our persons that were passed down through many generations. Just um, thinking about, I always talk about a sense of humor and how I come from a very funny family. You know, the family that cracks, you know, the bluest jokes at whatever <laughs> gathering where you're like, okay, this can't be said in public, but everybody's laughing. <laughs> right? But humor is a learned behavior. So when you think about, well, humor is a learned behavior, that means that somebody on the plantation was funny. Somebody on the slave ship had a sense of humor. Somebody running around wherever dealing with the horrors um, that, that had to do with being a displaced African in America had some sort of sense of something that people in my family or I still have today or just, you know, the simple things of, I always smile at children when I see them. Nobody told me to do that, but I watched other people in my family do that. So this thing that, that gets passed down, it's just really fascinating and getting to have some sense of what your elders went through. I mean, it gets me out of bed every day. I, I've had moments in my life where it's just been like, yeah, I don't think I can do this anymore. And then I go, oh, well, I could be in a, a cotton field picking cotton. I could be on my back in the big house somewhere doing something I really don't want to be doing. And I'm complaining about this. It's cool, I'm fine. <laughs> like I can get up. <laughs> it is great, it's great. So that's the power of history. And I just, I, I love the possibility of that. And I love that you're reaching back into, because when I think about blacksmithing, like I also think about the pain of that profession, um, how, how, you know, some people really benefited from that profession and some didn't. And, and there's a really interesting black tradition in blacksmithing that has just an incredible history of trauma and tragedy, but also power and self-preservation. Yeah. It's interesting, like, you know, even black, blacksmithing is actually a very, specific funny thing for me and my family because as I was making these hot combs me and my dad don't have the best relationship um and that's a whole nother conversation of course but I called him and I was like oh you know like he was like where are you and I was like I'm in the foundry and he was like wait a minute because my dad's a carpenter he was like you're in a foundry like you know fire metal anvil and I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm in a, I'm, I'm, you know, working in a foundry. And he said, did you know that your grandfather was, worked in the foundry in Columbus, Georgia? And 40, like, and many years ago, he was like the fastest molder in Columbus, Georgia. And I was like, I had no idea. And it's like, and you know, here I am in Providence, Rhode Island, reperforming potentially gestures that he would have done that I had no idea that he did. 
And then it's just how does, and then my father telling me opened up so many things. And so, so now I'm trying to find that interview with him talking about what he did in the ironworks. And it's just kind of funny, like me doing that told me something about my family that I didn't even know about. And how random and odd is that? But I don't think it is random and odd, right? Yeah. I think these things like you're talking about, they come up, they're in us. We just have to listen. Like, you know, my teacher turned in that forge and I was like, wait, I need to do that. You know, I saw something, I needed to do that. Um, and it's so, and it's just so interesting. Yeah, I, I believe I do a lot of like ancestral veneration altar work in my own practice that I don't, that I have not yet brought into my public practice, but doing that kind of uh, spirit work, I think is really powerful. The way in which you talked about how your grandmother came to you in a dream, like the access, and, and I can say this as someone whose parents are no longer here, like your relationships with your parents do not end just because they walk on. They continue and it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating. I remember when my mother passed away and thinking, well, man, I'm gonna miss her, but there's some things I'm really glad I'm not gonna hear anymore. You know, just the little things, but I hear them all the time. <laughs> They don't go away because it's a part of your DNA and it's something that they passed, that was passed on to them. And it's just this, it's this loop. So um, whatever way you can continue to archive just those moments of contact or moments of instinct that you have, I think you'd be really surprised to find out where the other links to them come from. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think that's very, that's very true. I mean, that's sort of, even my grandmother coming to me that day, that's why I started doing the hair painting stuff. And then I realized, and so the next day I woke up, I straightened, I found a hot comb someplace. I straightened my hair with a hot comb like she did. Oh and then I put on music and that she liked, or like started singing, like she liked like um, the Christmas song by Night King Cole, like a couple of songs that John and I used to sing growing up in the church. And so I sort of just like sing, I was singing them and had the music on and just sort of let whatever happen happen. Mm -hmm. And then I turned around and was just like, you know, our my body is talking, you know, my body is transcribing and has the power to transcribe language and, and information and history and pain and love. And in this way, am I memorializing? And in this way, I can memorialize my grandmother. And mm -hmm. so that really became the project for such a long time is just like, how do I, continue to try to memorialize her and think about her and live with her. So then I wrote her like 20 letters explaining to her like each of the hair paintings I had done being like, well, in this hair painting, I was like in Slovenia and I was doing this and, you know, and it was just, you know, she's passed away. She's been gone. I mean, 16 years now, 17 years. And I still feel like I talk to her every single day. Oh yeah. And yeah. that's amazing. I totally agree. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's, I love those paintings, by the way. I think they're just so fantastic and so alive. It's interesting to to see and then have to think about how they're made. And then just the complex, I've been through so much with hair over my life up to this point that um, it's just something to really think about how hair is used as currency or not used in that way, how hair is positioned to uh, to make Black people feel less than, how hair is used even to divide Black people within the Black community, you know, the good hair, bad hair exactly. sort of situation, and the like internalized um, kind of cisgendered, overly cisgendered uh, misogyny that comes along with a lot of that too. It's, it's taken me a, a long time to unlearn some of that stuff because it's so much in the societal sphere. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your comments about my hair paintings. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. but, but also like, I completely agree. I feel like, you know, even me growing out my own hair cause I decided to stop cutting my hair in my junior year of college. And once I decided I wasn't gonna cut my hair, my dad like basically tricked me into getting a haircut. Like I felt, I felt tricked, honestly. And I can't remember exactly how it happened, but I know I got a haircut against my will. And then I started again my senior year of college and have, and then, and I was like, I'm moving to New York. 
my hair is my strength. Like I need as much strength as I need. I don't know what I'm going to be doing when I'm in New York City. I moved to New York City. The first thing I, I, I'm there for a month, the hardest month of my entire life, crying every single day, breaking up with my Italian boyfriend who was living in Milan. You know? And I just like working a job where I was like making any money. And the first thing I did was that I cut the size of my hair off. Yeah. And there was so much, you know, my mom was always like, you know, when a woman cuts their hair off, like something's wrong with them and all this stuff. And I was just like, mm, no, but then I like, but then my brother was like, you cut your hair off. Like, are you good? You know what I mean? Like check in, like, you, like no. what's going on? You it's know? A, it's such a, like I just cut off 20 years of really long dreadlocks. <clears throat> wow. They had to go. And it was because hair is also, it's a protector. It takes on the energy um, around all sorts of experiences. Uh, I had gotten really fed up with all sorts of things like going to the airport and just being able to go through security without somebody asking me if they could touch, they needed to put on some gloves and go through my hair, stuff like that. Or asking myself questions as to why Am I growing the dreadlocks as long as I'm growing them because I'm trying to be natural and feel free? Or am I growing them as long as I have because I've internalized this kind of white supremacist aesthetic around the length of hair? Like, what is that? And um, I remember it was some scene from like Black Panther or something where one of the female warriors, she had to wear a wig to go into something. And she's really upset with this wig on her head and she tears it off and throws it to the ground. And I go, I think I want that life. I think I will okay. not deal anymore with the just, and I do a lot of like, um, well, I did, I do a lot of things in water. And like, if you swim in the sea, dreadlocks, it picks up the weight of the salt. And you come oh. in, out of the water and all of a sudden something pulls you down, but there's nothing there. No, it's the weight of the salt water in the hair. <laughs> it's, it's strange things like that, but it's, it's a really liberating thing to be able to do with your hair, what you want to do with your hair. It's a very, when I first started growing my dreadlocks, I won't tell you who said it, but there's someone in my family that told me that I looked like a pickaninny. <laughs> A black person, ah. and I said, "Do you hear what you are saying right now? You like you, you are traumatizing me. Why are you traumatizing me? Well, <laughs> you look like a pickaninny. No, I don't look like a pickaninny. This is called, you know, um, but it, but it also it was an incredible essay by Alice Walker, where I decided to grow those. Where she talked about in the same way that your grandmother talked about how your hair is your." Um, crown in a sense how it's it's your guide uh, I've always it's always upset at me though that um black women and men that we felt that we needed to take this comb to it that we needed to tame it what we don't have to tame nothing mm -hmm. you know what's that about I know I mean I don't you know I when you know with me doing the hair painting process it was the only time, like that was the first time in my life where I, you know, had put heat on my hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, of course. And I was just like, and so I'm in my kitchen and I have a gas stove and I have the thing and I'm like, I'm like, people are doing this. Yes. And it, for me, it became like this ritual of transformation. You know, I, as Jared was becoming this tool um, and literally that I could dip my hair in and then make these objects. But you know, like now, I mean, and I still do hair paintings from time to time. And mm -hmm. but I haven't, and I and I mean I haven't done one maybe in eight months. I haven't straightened my hair with a hot comb in like eight or nine months. Um but I mean now I just wear twists, you know. I'm just like so simple, like wake up in the morning, untwist my hair, have my twist out, it's crazy, we love it. Um I cut my I do I do my own hair. I cut my sides off when I'm ready for them to be cut off, you know what I mean? And that's the way it could should be, because you can when I was doing all that stuff to my hair before I went back to being natural there's certain things that i couldn't do i couldn't go swimming i couldn't you know just be out in the rain without freaking out about it was ridiculous and so there's a lot of freedom that comes from just accepting what your hair you know what it will do and i just love that you're memorializing it 
in a way that gives it a lot more agency than then we're 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 burning our hair and our scalps and you know don't get me started on like the whole chemical stuff i've sat exactly. in competitions chairs sitting there with my scalp burning but not telling them because i need it i want it to be as straight as possible right what kind of prison is that that is you know, <laughs> that's a prison and it's uh it's a powerful experience to be able to release that and and art really gives you the you know the capacity to say well wait a minute i don't have to do those things and instead exactly. i can make it instead exactly exactly um there's actually I, we have like i don't know how much like maybe 15 more minutes but there was on your website i went through your coda section and you mm -hmm. have these amazing kind of um illustrated scores um kind of collaged images in my mind i i was thinking i mean i, I was thinking like those pieces of those images could be played i still was like these are scores you know in my mind like these are scores that can be played and i just wanted you to talk about those images a little bit i can put them in the in the drop the little thingy yeah everything is music like uh, all the i like i can i still love working um, with Western notation and everything on my website, those are just excerpts. So it doesn't, those are visual excerpts that don't, that often don't include um, the Western no notated parts of that music because I still love those Western structures, but I also love the possibility of what um, an object can translate that is not using that language because that language also is representative of a certain kind of colonialist uh aesthetic about what is you know what is language you know there's so many different types of music languages but you rarely get to hear about the others um and also i've had a lot of experience working with improvisers who couldn't read music but who could read shapes and colors or if you describe something to them in text they could play that text they could play that yeah in a way that someone who is I've been really fortunate to, you know, I'm conservatory trained. I'm never gonna be able to get away from that. And I've been lucky enough to be around musicians who are like, you know, savants with their ability to read or write music. But some of those people that I've worked with, they could not translate um, those graphics in quite the same way because they were so imprisoned by the colonialist aesthetic of, of what imitation. Um, so everything, everything that I make is something that can be played, will be played, has been played, is being experimented with. But I really like having, like with your um, hair paintings, having this piece of ephemera that can sit in a different way, that can sit in a gallery space, that can sit in a museum, that can sit in a public installation, that can be seen on a screen. Um, I think a lot about uh, like quilting aesthetics and how, you know, a quilt had a very particular utilitarian value, but it also could be hung up on the wall. It's so beautiful, you know? Um, so I think about that a lot. And uh, I, it's just, it's also kind of a, how you say, an exploration into failure, like what could work and what couldn't work, you know? And sometimes with some of those graphic scores, they don't work, they're not working. Um, and so I've also tried to spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, okay, what is that? And what are the boundaries? Do I have boundaries? I thought I said I had no limits, but maybe there is a limit here. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything on my website and everything that I make is, is still really a, a work in progress, I guess. Um, I yeah, I, you know, well, this is breathing is there, you're living with it. You know what I mean? It actually, it changes to, it changes with the person that interacts with it. You know, it changes, you know, in the base of the environment that it's in, you know, and I think that's so, I think, you know, I, I think a lot about how people get caught up about being the canonical artist. You know, I want to make sure that my work is in the museum so that people remember it forever. And when I die, my kids can point at it. You know what I mean? But I think that 
art and artists, we're actually our real people, organic beings that actually, you know, transform and change. And we actually have to compromise with, and we actually have to like, you know, feed and address and, and water. Um, and so it's so beautiful and nice just to hear like, and, I mean, of course, like you have, like, you've done everything. Like, you, like you've been in the museums, you've done the Whitney Biennial, you know. But I mean, I feel like it's just nice, so nice that you have such a, um, like, you just listen to yourself, you know, about what you actually want and your desires. And that's what I'm getting so inspired by. Like, as an artist who is often, you know, gets, to, like, can easily get told, like, oh, maybe that's not worth your time, or maybe this is worth your time. And I am just continuing to trust, trust myself you know, and trust my own instincts and intuitions. It's just so nice to see that that's just, you know, that you are doing that too. And, and we're, you know, it's working for us, you know, and, and, and we don't have to fit ourselves in these other ways in order to, you know, make the work that we find are important. Yeah, I don't believe in boxes. And, and that's a hard thing to say as a music person too, because, you know, my main instrument is saxophone at this point. I still play clarinet, but it's not as, you know, front and center. And I've had to really fight um, to not, you know, people, they go, Black person, saxophone, jazz, period, the end. There's no period <laughs> to my life and to no. things that I'm interested in. And, and now, like, I'm okay with people saying that now, but in the beginning, trying to get people to understand, well, yeah, that's something I do, but I'm also doing this other stuff. And, it, and it's all related. There's nothing, there are no separate lanes. Um, it's all part of the sort of wider experience that I'm trying to have. And I will not let anybody boil me down to something they can market, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I really think that certain ideas that come to us as artists come to us for very specific reasons. For each person, for each individual person, it's very, very specific. And you have to follow through with those ideas, you know, whatever your instinct is telling you, because there's always people who are going to tell you what they think you should be doing. How do they know what you should be doing? Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. It's weird codependency. Like, why don't you stay in your lane and do what you think you need to be doing? But I'm going to do this right now. They're like, thank you. Thank you for your, you know, <laughs> your comments though. <laughs> I'll show you this when I'm done. <laughs> I hope that doesn't make it sound like I'm again, because I think generative criticism is also really important and really powerful. But at the end of the day, as a creative person, you have a, you know why you're doing what you're doing and you have to see it through in order to understand the next steps you want to take. That's my opinion. Some people yeah. might do. No, I, I agree. And, and in, in the same way, you know, and thinking about, you know, my kind of, our, both of our practice, I think, conceptually, you know, you have to understand your history and your family and your legacy. And move, and so we can move forward from that too. You know what I mean? I think like you, you talked earlier um, in our like pre-conversation about like your search with genealogy and you're, you know, going through the South and trying to find your family and, and figuring out where they are and where they have been and, and what communities they were a part of and, and how important um, that search is for you. Um, yeah, can we talk a little bit more about that actually? Oh, sure. I just, um, I just grew up around people where you'd be sitting at the dinner table and all of a sudden they start telling stories. And then it got to an eventual point where I would repeat some of the stories to other people and they go, what? Like what? Like, what is that? And because I thought that was normal that people had a lot of details about certain stories in their family history. So I feel really fortunate that I grew up around that because it put me on a, on a particular kind of search and the bloodline that we come from, sadly, because it's the backbone of, of uh, imperialist, capitalistic um, undertones of the US, is uh, can be traced because it's a business. Bodies were businesses, you know? And mm -hmm. though, you know, it only, I've been able to go as far back now as like uh, early 1700s, no, 1600s London. Um, there's a lot that you can find, you know, fortunately for some of us, but not for all of us. So I, I, 
the stories that I have and the stories that I've been told, they've just allowed me to kind of push through a lot of things that have happened to me in my life up until this point, like I was saying, where it's like, oh, okay, well, this is really bad what's just happened to me at this you know, at this gallery show or at this, or by this music promoter or by this record label or, you know, whatever it is, or wow, you know, I'm really broke right now, um, but I'm not chained up somewhere. You know, I'm not like, there's a lot of power in having uh, some kind of knowledge of, of where you come from, I do feel. But, you know, there's some people who, who are able to move in really powerful ways for themselves, not knowing that. that mm -hmm. is, but you and I, we come from a very specific uh, sale. There's no, you can't, there's no, I can't even say, oh, you know, if maybe it wasn't all that bad. No. No, we know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was bad. Um, and so I just feel like, I always say that I stand on the backs of many people that never got a chance to express themselves. And that keeps me moving. That's very real. Yeah, that's very real. Um, I have conversations with my mom about this all the time, you know, just, you know, how it's so, I mean, even her, like she like raised two kids, she had a job, she was supporting her husband, you know, they got divorced and, you know, she's about to retire and she's like, wait, what did I do for myself? You know what I mean? What are the things like, how can, can I express myself? You know, like, and now she's like, and now, so like, me and John have been encouraged her to write, like she really wants to write children's books. She really wants to write children's books. Wow. And I'm like, mom, do it. let's do it. <laughs> you know, like, like and we have conversations about her outline. She said, you know, but just like really, like how, you know, how do we empower ourselves also to keep moving? You know, that's so real. It's interesting. It's the privilege of time, eh? You know, like that your mom has finally been able to have a moment to think, oh, well, maybe I want to do that. Yeah. You know, and thinking about so many people in our lineages that they, I come from so, I come from a long line of service people, of people who had to take care of other people um, and never just never got a chance to have the privilege of time to think about maybe what they'd like to do, you know? Exactly. It's so powerful. And that's why, we, you know, we in so many ways get to be our ancestors' like greatest dream, you know? And that's I'm, just so, you know what I mean? Dream. And, that's, and, and that is something that I just feel like everybody can, um, can relate to no matter where they come from, uh, because we all got here by some, you know, some sort of something and uh, someone had an idea to do something that put us all where we are at in this moment. And that's such a powerful thing to think about. And I, I wish more people had the opportunity to find out more about where they come from for that reason. Cause it really gives you that, that thing of like, okay, they really suffered. So I can sit here and talk on a Zoom. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, they, they really said they, they couldn't even imagine this, you know, uh, the confidence that I have to just move around the world is 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 something they fought for, you know, with with allyship alongside them, but still. Um, so I'm not going to squander it. No, exactly. Oh, so amazing. This is an amazing conversation, honestly. Great. Like, I can't wait to keep talking to you about stuff. <laughs> like, I feel like I want it like improv with you. I would love to make a painting. I would love for you to play. I would love for us to, you know what I mean? Like my, actually my cousin, Eric, he um, just graduated or he's, a, he's like in the process of getting him his DMA from um, a school in Texas and he's an oboe player. Wow. And, wow. and I, yeah, I and mean, that's a, how he got into oboe is kind of like, it's my fault, but I'm so happy that I got him into oboe. That's, really um, that's a hard I played bassoon for a year it was a nightmare it was, <laughs> <laughs> no, i'm not doing this it's uh but it's there's a lot of really fascinating repertoire for the oboe too it's it's such yeah. a particular sound it is it's such a particular and that's what i told him like because he was in high school or maybe in middle school and he was like playing various instruments and i was like you know if you play the oboe 
you always have a job. If you get really good at the oboe, I was like, no one's, people don't play oboe well. And the music is really specific. You know what I mean? If you are like a black queer person who plays oboe well, I just feel like you're gonna have everything, you know? And so we'll see, he's um, he's young, like he's a, you know, he has like two more years still in his program. Um, but he and I are trying to figure out also ways to collaborate, you know, with movement and dance and gesture. I care a lot about, and the hair painting work is, you know, formally is really a big call and response, right? It's yeah. a big call and response circle. Even the way that I, um, even when I perform it with an audience, I try not to really have it be like stage, proscenium, kind of the dark abyss audience. I really try to have the audience wrapped around like a, in a circle as much as I can um, in, the, in, the, in the performance so that they can respond. Um, but he and I have been thinking a lot about how do we how do we build together as some kind of improvisational score that reflects on movement, gesture, and and color response? No, um, I love it. it's uh, thinking about like I never like to think about audience. I call them witness, like they're witness, they're part exactly. of the experience. It's not like oh here's this voyeuristic thing and here I am on a stage or presenting something. That's so that always just fills me with a lot of dread to think about it like that. You know, and the circle is just such a such a symbolic um, gathering of, of of bodies and embodiment in a space. Yeah, and it's like, you know, it's so tied up in the ways I think that Black people, you know, build community. You know, and and think about and historically, we you know, I did a lot of I I'm doing a lot of reading and writing about kind of ways that African traditions are surviving in America right now through Black communities and, and specific Black communities. And I think a lot about the ways, you know, um, in African dance, for example, because I spent a lot of time doing um, Monday West African dance, how your relationship with the master drummer and all the dancers is actually a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a conversation, it's a dialogue, you know? And how then I think about, you know, Black church in Alabama and the hooping and hollering and all the call and response that happens there. But those forms are actually exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the, our drum master. We have the points that we understand that we get to engage. We understand that they influence each other. Yeah. And it's so important that, you know, in my practice, I continue to live that tradition. You know, that tradition of performance, that tradition of community making. Um, becomes really important to me. Yeah, it's the celebration of spirit, all of that. Of, yeah. you know, whether it's, it, whether it's uh, dance or whether it's in the church or whether it's on the corner or whether like just the gathering of bodies doing some sort of almost ritual performance. Exactly. Improvisation of spirit. It's exactly. so Yeah, I agree. Huh. I mean, this makes you think of your, the piece that you did, um, I. I Call America uh -huh. that you did at the Whitney Museum. Can you talk uh, a little bit about that <laughs> right before we leave? Sure, that, I mean, that really, um, I owe a lot to the Whitney. They like they just really pull out, pulled out all the stops for me um, when they built the new, the new location in the Meatpacking District. I got to give concerts in that building before it was open to the public while it was still being, we had to wear hard hats and, and no. <laughs> Um, so I just, every time I'm in that building, I just feel a special affinity, but they really understood that my practice was multidisciplinary and gave me space to, to have this, the art studio of my dreams, really, um, to create stations and a space that represented, uh, the different ways in which I work when I'm making my own work in private and allowing it to be public so that people could see but not necessarily interact, they could just observe. Um, and then it allowed me to create a piece where I could bring musicians together uh, to play uh, the pieces that I created. And I'm still, a lot of the exhibitions that I'm involved in um, since then have a lot to do with the processes that I created during that sort of odd residency. Um, the space that they they gave me it really it affirmed who I who I felt I was at that time um, but most of all it gave me time you know this 
talking about just being able to have time to try things and to understand that failure is not really like, what is that word? What, you know, what does that mean? Failure just means, okay, I'm gonna go this way instead of that way. Or failure means, oh, well, maybe I'll try it this way instead of, of that way. So uh, yeah, I'm still really feeding off of that experience. Um, and then they allowed me to have a, a new, I think it was a New Year's Eve countdown <laughs> concert at the Whitney, which was just an amazing experience um, in a museum that's housed so many of my heroes mm -hmm. to be able to create there. I think I, I, I think even a decade from now, I'll probably still buzzing, be buzzing from that. Dang, that's amazing. It was Dang. amazing. <laughs> um, this was so fun. This was amazing. I, just, <laughs> I love your work. I love hearing about your ideas and how you think in your process. I love how organic it is and how fluid. There's just, there just seems to be like a fluidity of uh, possibility. Um, and I just find that really inspiring, you know? It's, uh, creativity is about play, right? Exactly. And so being- And discovery. A, right, play and discovery, you know? And it's something that I feel like gets beaten out of us as we grow or something like. <laughs> You don't have to do that anymore. You have to be an adult person, and adult people don't do this. No, this they is. They know everything. They know. They know. We're supposed to know. They don't know anything. <laughs> okay, I keep learning that. When I think I have, I know enough. I still don't know enough. So real. And it keeps us working. Oh, yeah. I see our wonderful host is back. <laughs> I'm back. Thank you all so much. This is so beautiful. Um, I'm just so touched um, again that you deigned to join us today. So thank you again for that and just these incredible insights and just being so uh, generous in your conversation today with each other. Thank you. It was really fun. So fun. Like I, I'm gonna definitely email you. Please <laughs> email each other. <laughs> Be friends in real life. <laughs> Make a post-pandemic date. Okay. I love this. <laughs> um, and actually, I met you like only during the pandemic as well. It's true. Yeah. Because oh, I've never met you in real life. We've never met in person. Honestly, there are so many people, people I've never really... met. Huh? There's so many people I actually have never it's met crazy. in person now. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> so crazy. But, but I mean, all... yeah, I was like, oh, maybe this is like. Instagram where you have like all these friends, but you meet them, you don't meet them, but then you meet them and you're like, where do I know them from? Oh. Exactly. <laughs> it's literally been Instagram. <laughs> Life is Instagram now, it's amazing. So, no, but thank you for putting this together. It was really fun. Yeah, I'm so happy that you enjoyed yourselves. It's really a pleasure. Um, I hope that, oh, hopefully next year we'll see what happens. I would love to continue this series. We'll figure it out. Um, because I think it's important to really break down the barriers that have been created between music and visual art and performance. And I just think, you know, the more that we have conversations together about what we're ultimately trying to get at through, you know, these different methods and media of our choice, the more we sort of all bring a different kind of vision to life, you know? Well, I learned so you learn. I just learned so much. Like once when I get off this call, I'm just notes, notes. <laughs> yeah, I have my notes. Like I'm like, yes, okay, cool. I gotta go do that. I want to see Alice Walker crown poem essay. Like, what is that? <laughs> what is it's my point? I'm like, yes, my my plan has come together. Thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you to Bryce for you know giving me the space to do this and bring these incredible conversations. Of course, thank you to Jared Key and Montana Roberts again, to our past guests, uh, Sade McConan and Cecily, also Casa Overall and Nate Lewis, who I think is in the audience today. Um, I hope to have an opportunity to, you know, have you all together in person one day. Uh, it'll be great. I don't know if it's gonna happen in the next nine months, but that's okay. <laughs> um, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, Hmm? No, yeah, I hope it happens. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I'm optimistic generally. 
Um, thank you all so much, so much again. And I think uh, we'll be ending up here. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you. Bye. So much. Bye. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. You too. Take care. You too. Stay safe. <laughs>